Hello, my beautiful friends. I am Laurel Bleeden Maffei with Illuminating Souls, welcoming you to this episode of Sleepy Bedtime Blessings, a podcast designed to help you rest, relax, and fall asleep, all while deepening in your connection with your beautiful team of angels who love you so. If this is your first time listening, welcome. I am delighted that somehow you found your way here. And allow me to take just a moment to introduce myself. I am an angelic practitioner, a spiritual teacher, and an encourager of souls. And I do this through one-on-one angel sessions, soul mentoring, and a variety of classes designed to inspire your spirit. And you can learn more at my website, illuminatingsouls.com where you can also sign up for my daily inspiration email blast. And you'll receive an inspiring email from me every weekday. And that, my friends, is the extent of the advertising you will hear on this podcast because this podcast is sponsored by me (laughs) and the angels and illuminating souls. So I appreciate your love and support, and it is truly a blessing to be here with you. As most of you know, this podcast is born of my great love of sleep podcasts and angels, so it is an unlikely mashup of two of my favorite forms of self-care. I listen to a sleep podcast every night to help me go to sleep. And that is why I've created this for you. I think there is something quite lovely about hearing a loving, soothing, companionable voice rambling a bit as you drift off to sleep. And I've heard from many of you that you listen during the daytime while you commute to work or go about your day and however you choose to listen to this broadcast, I am profoundly grateful for the gift of you. Each episode runs about an hour and there are two parts to each episode. This first part is when I bring the angels in. And they bring in this beautiful wave of love for you. And we talk a little bit about something spiritually focused. And then I read to you or tell you a story or share some memories from my life. But all in all, it's going to be about an hour because that's my preference when choosing a sleep podcast episode. If it's not close to an hour long, I feel this pressure to be asleep. (laughs) There's one sleep podcast that I really adore, but her episodes are only about 20 minutes long. And so they're lovely for 4 a.m. and I'm just, you know, kind of snoozing a little bit before it's time to wake up. But I can't listen to them before I go to sleep because I feel really disappointed if I'm not asleep by the time her episode ends. So that's why this is an hour long. So as I record this episode, it is early morning and we've just had the time shift here in the U.S. And so it's still dark out. But in all likelihood, by the time I finish recording this episode, the sun will have risen And the birds in my neighborhood get very noisy when that happens in the loveliest way possible. 
So just know that at some point in the next hour, you may have the blessing of some added auditory ambiance brought to you by our neighborhood bird population. But for now, I invite you to get comfortable in your body and take some nice deep breaths in and out as we gently call ourselves forward into the heart of God. And I do use the word God, but if God is not a word that works for you, you're welcome to switch out any of my vocabulary for yours. Some people prefer the word source or universe or divine light. So I want you to adapt what I share with you so that it suits you best. So I always love this invitation to call ourselves gently into the heart of God. And I always find when that invitation comes through that I take a deep breath in and I center somewhere within myself and it helps me connect with the waves of love that are ever present even when we are unaware of them they are still here so let's take that deep breath in together allowing the light to flow in and I have to apologize I have a little bit of a frog in my throat this morning I feel perfectly fine But if you hear a little bit of strangeness in my voice, that's what it is. But I'm perfectly fine. I just have morning voice. And nothing will keep me from recording this episode for you. So I'll just keep going. So here we are. Using our breath to come into the heart of God. And I'm going to call the angels in, even though they are already here. I love sharing the ritual with you of inviting them forward. So beautiful angels on high, I invite you to join us here. And angels, I ask that you infuse this broadcast with waves of love bringing forth beautiful healing light in service to each of our beloveds gathered here now. Angels, I know that you know what each of our listeners is going through. I ask that you help bring to them blessings of grace easing their path, bringing to them miracles, serendipity, and goodness. And dear ones, just take some nice deep breaths in. And whatever prayers are on your heart or worries, anything that feels burdensome to you. You are invited to give this over to the angels and they will carry it for you. They will transmute it into prayers and light. So just take a deep breath in Allowing your body to receive these waves of relaxation, these soothing, calming infusions of divine light that will make it easier for you to relax and drift off when the time is right. You, my beautiful friend, you are a blessing from on high. 
You are a timeless and wise being who has chosen to incarnate in this time and space. And I believe that those of us who resonate as light workers and light bearers or bringers of light, all different phrases that mean the same thing, that we are here to help evolve consciousness. We are here to seed more love into this world. And so in all likelihood, you are someone who feels deeply. I know for myself, I am one who feels life through my heart, through my emotional body. I shared on the last episode about my dad and he was worried for me that I was so sensitive. And I now know that my sensitivity is a superpower because it lets me do this work, lets me feel the love that is in the metaphoric room with us right now. And it allows me to sense and know the true beauty of your soul. So take a big breath in and give yourself permission to connect with the magic in your soul. That is one of the phrases that has given me so much altitude over the last 20 years. This concept that I have magic in my soul that was part of one of the first affirmations I ever used at USM. So that's the University of Santa Monica, if you're new to the broadcast, and it's where I went to get my degree in spiritual psychology. And in the first night, in the first weekend, they lead us through a process so we can connect with the quality that we will work with throughout the year and an affirmation. And the quality that I connected with for my first year at USM was joyful and radiant self-love. And this was because I did not know how to love myself. I knew how to love myself when others loved me. There's a beautiful lyric in a song by David Wilcox. And he says in the song, there's a break in the cup that holds love inside of me. And I felt like that was true about me. My ability to love myself seemed to be contingent upon how I was received in the greater world. If other people loved me, I was lovable. But if that love left the room, I did not know how to center myself in my own beingness in a way that was loving. I highly identified with my flaws and my wounds and my sad stories. I wasn't a sad person, but I believe that we all live a narrative about ourselves that we get to write. And my narrative felt this concept of self-love to be elusive. And I think also it is because I had associated this concept of self-love with grandiosity, which is very egoic, right? Self-love being, I am awesome, (laughs) I'm spectacular. And that's never been my style. 
And that's not what I mean by self-love. So that quality of joyful and radiant self-love where I could have a deep appreciation and love and compassion for myself seems like a prayer. And then that first affirmation included the phrase, and I am enthusiastically listening to the magic in my soul. I just loved all those words. I am enthusiastically listening to the magic in my soul. And one of the things they teach us at USM is that a good affirmation only needs to feel 50% true. So it can feel very much like a prayer, which my affirmation did for the longest time. But I found that I lived my way into both the quality and the affirmation. So now when I say I am experiencing joyful and radiant self-love, it means that I love myself in the sweetest of ways. I have profound compassion for my earth girl, for my human journey. I can love myself in my imperfections. I can love myself when I'm sad, I can love myself when I'm accomplished. I can love myself when I am struggling. Because this form of love has no polarity. It has no on and off switch. It simply is. Which is how I also experience the love of the angels. And it is the love of the angels and God that helped me learn how to love myself in the same way. You know, life is life. We all have our ups and downs. We are all exquisitely beautiful and deeply flawed. <laughs> we are all of it. Every single one of us. And this divine love is, it always is, it exists. And my hope is that through this time together in this podcast, the angels and I will get to help you deepen in your connection with the awareness of this love that is always here for you. This relationship with the angels, your connection with divine love, belongs to you. It is yours. It has always been here for you since before you were born. So if you just breathe for a moment, allowing the angels to amplify your connection with divine love, love and breathe. The angels will help you open to it. And so I remind you that you are precious in this world. That you are born of the breath of God that has dreamed you into being. You carry love in your heart that only you can deliver. This world is better because you are here. And I'm so deeply grateful for the gift of you. So just allow the divine light to surround you. And if you have prayers in your heart, intentions or affirmations, you can share these with the angels and God now. You can let the angels know how they can help you. How can your angels support you? What would you like to put into the light? 
can just share this with the angels and they are receiving your heart's prayers and requests right now. And take a breath and allow this ripple of goodness and compassion to move through you now, bringing to you a lightness of spirit, feeling your body grow both lighter and heavier at the same time as your body relaxes and lets go and receives the love that is here right now. This love has been calibrated just for you. And I will share this just because it is what I am sensing. It feels as if the angels are doing a healing and clearing on our throat chakras. This is in service to helping you connect with your authentic voice and your authentic truth. So just to breathe and allow the angels to clear your energy field through the heart of God. And the angels will stay with you throughout this episode and beyond. So you go ahead and rest, drift off if you feel so guided. And while you rest, we're going to move into story time and I'm going to read to you and ramble and share some stories with you. So for this episode, I am going to be flipping through an old copy of TV Guide. And I have to say, I really hope that you guys enjoy these episodes as much as I do. I love television and I was a TV baby for sure. And flipping through these old episodes delights me. And I know a few of you have reached out to me to tell me that you enjoy them as well. So I'm hoping this will be fun for you too. So the issue we're going to be flipping through is from mid-January of 1963. So I'm not even a year old right now in the timeline of my life. But a lot of the television shows that were airing back then, you know, They were part of the rerun culture, so I know a lot of them, although not all of them. But I also thought it would be fascinating to look back at what was happening in the world in 1963. So I went into a conversation with my new AI bestie, (laughs) ChatGPT. And there's an ad that I'll flip to a little later for GE televisions in this issue. So I asked ChatGPT a couple of questions, and so I'm going to read to you a little bit to contextualize what was happening in the U.S. in 1963, especially as it pertains to television. So I started off by asking it about the price of the televisions in this issue. So it says, to address your question about the prices of GE televisions in 1963, adjusting for inflation, a television that cost $139.95 would be equivalent to around $1,200 in 2023. And then there's a console television for about $200.00. And that's equivalent to about $1,700 today. In terms of television viewing habits, in 1960, just over 87% of households had a television. 
So that was just about everybody. And by 70, it was up to 93%. So we definitely had television in 1963 in our house. But color television was not yet widely available. So they say that even though color programs were being broadcast in the 1950s, the technology was very expensive. So in 1967, only about 5% of households in the U.S. had color. But by the early 70s, that figure had risen to over 50%. I don't think we got our first color television until the 70s at some point. It's also interesting to note that World War II ended in 1945. So 1963 was closer to the end of World War II than we are today to 9-11. So that contextualizes where the culture was in terms of awareness of World War II and the impact it would have had. But also, we're in the post-war economic boom. ChatGPT also informs me that in 1963, households were watching an average of five hours of television a day. So by that point, TV was already well entrenched into the American culture. And some of the popular television shows of the time, perhaps you will remember some of these, the Beverly Hillbillies. How many of you remember all the words to the theme song? Now listen to a story about a man named Jed, a poor mountaineer barely kept his family fed, I was going to stop there, but I can't. I don't know about you. I have to keep going. But then one day, he was shooting at some food. And up through the ground came some bubbling crude. What's the next part? All together. Oil, that is. Black gold. Texas tea. (laughs) How many of you remembered that with me? I will not sing the song to all of these, but I just had to do that. It was there. So Beverly Hillbillies, Bonanza, The Dick Van Dyke Show, Andy Griffith, The Lucy Show, Candid Camera, The Ed Sullivan Show, Perry Mason, the Jack Benny Show, and the Red Skelton Show. And I do have to give a special shout out to the Ed Sullivan Show, which we watched, I think it was every Sunday. And I learned about the magic of plate spinners and fire eaters and acrobats and things like that. As a kid, that's what I loved more than the musicians, right? I also asked in 1963 how many women were working outside of the home at that point. And it said in 1963, the percentage of women in the labor force was almost 30%. So this concept of two working parents was not entirely unusual, but most women stayed home. Okay, so that's a little context of 1963. Again, I would have been eight months old and likely incredibly adorable, I'm sure, but with no context, no awareness of television. There are some opening snippets, and I love this one. It says, although each network would gladly give up two vice presidents, to sign Judy Garland for her projected weekly series next season, CBS claims to have the inside track, mostly because Judy does her specials on CBS. Her next, with Phil Silvers and Robert Goulet, is scheduled for March 19th. Now, I have not seen all of Judy Garland's specials, but I've seen parts of them. 
And that must have been very, very special to be able to watch. It is also worth noting there were no VCRs and you had to watch it when it aired. There was no YouTube. So you watched it when it was on or maybe you caught it in reruns or else you were out of luck. So a very different relationship with programming back then. They're talking about Bob Hope specials, which were even happening back then. A musical variety special starring Buster Keaton and Tammy Grimes and the Baird Puppets. I don't know who that is. I do know who Buster Keaton and Tammy Grimes are. And there's going to be a rerun of Mary Martin's Peter Pan, which I remember. I don't know how many of you remember the Mary Martin Peter Pan special and a little celebrity trivia. Do you know who Mary Martin's son is? Larry Hagman from Dallas, I think. Okay, you know what? I just had to go look it up because I was doubting my celebrity trivia wisdom. But yes, indeed, Mary Martin's son is Larry Hagman, not only of Dallas, but since we are talking about 1960s and 70s television, also the star of I Dream of Jeannie. So there you go. There's a lot of things I don't know in the world, but I read a lot of People magazine back in the day. (laughs) So we'll keep going. On the cover, I should tell you, of this TV guide is Car 54, which starred Fred Gwynn, who you might know better as Herman Munster. And I believe he played the judge in My Cousin Vinny. Again, random, weird People magazine from the 1980s trivia that lives in my brain. And the other actor, I don't know, but it doesn't mean he's not important. So let me find his name. Joe E. Ross, who I don't, I don't have any trivia about him. I'm sure though, he's a very accomplished actor. There is a very interesting article with a linguist who is complaining about how sloppy television speech is not good for the nation. And it's very interesting. And this is by Gilbert Shea, a speech consultant and author of Speaking American English. So he talks about Ed Sullivan's high-pitched, abrupt, halting nasal garble. (laughs) He's talking about Arlene Francis and her affected theatrical Eastern speech. And he feels that it's making it harder to understand what's happening. So anyways, I thought that was an interesting article, which I can't read to you because it's copyrighted. So I'm just going to glance over it and sort of give you a really bad assessment of it. And then here's the ad for the televisions that I referenced in the opening. So there is a 19 inch portable television. Now, it doesn't look all that portable. It's a big square, or it's not really a square. It's, uh, you know, a television shaped box on this chrome stand. So I think that's what makes it portable. It has this stand that can wheel about. So it's just sort of sitting on the stand. And that one is $139.95. And I adjusted that for $2,023 for you in the opening. I'm not going to go back and look at my notes now. And then there's a 23-inch console 
which will look very familiar to any of you who had living rooms in the 60s, and that's $199.95. And it also bears noting that the televisions then did not have remote control. The remote control was the kid nearest to the dial. <laughs> and there wasn't a lot of channel flipping because there weren't a lot of channels, but it truly was channel flipping because you had to click the dial. The other thing that I was remembering when I was flipping through this issue to get a little bit of a preview of what we might talk about is that in the wee hours of the morning, the TV stations went off the air. I had forgotten that. How many of you remember when the TV stations would sign off? There would be some sort of prayer or something and then it would go to the color bars. And then it would start up in the morning again with a sermon or something. And I remember what it felt like to stay up so late that the TV stations were off the air. <laughs> something the modern generations will never know. So I'm going to skip over the TV shows on Saturday morning. I was too young to watch them. But there's things like Rin Tin Tin and Roy Rogers, my friend Flicka, Mr. Wizard. Perhaps you remember some of these. But I'm going to go ahead and skip ahead. So we're now on Saturday night, and there is a rerun of Jackie Gleason. How many of you also grew up with Jackie Gleason? This is... Not the Honeymooners, this is his variety show. And on this rerun show, Jackie's guest is Spanish singer Alfredo Cross. There's also a show called Sam Benedict. I don't know any of these. The Defenders. It looks like Buster Keaton has a show on television called Mr. Smith. There's Death Valley Days, which I seem to recall was a Western. And Joey Bishop has a show on, which is in color. There's a little box that indicates that it's in color. We have Lawrence Welk airing. The show Have Gun Will Travel. Gun Smoke. So definitely a lot of Westerns on on Saturday night. I'll read to you the Gun Smoke summary in case you know this episode. I really never watched Gun Smoke, but I'll read it in case you did. An old man named Cotter dies in Dodge City and leaves Matt an envelope to be delivered to his daughter, Clary. Matt finds Clary, but she isn't at all like the sweet little girl pictured in Cotter's photograph. She's an uninhibited, unrestrained, teenage nature girl. And Clary is played by a young Mariette Hartley. That's interesting. Okay, we'll keep going. And just to reference the stations going off the air, the at 1.45 a.m. on Saturday, there's a movie, which is one hour and 35 minutes. And then that station ends with a sermonette at 3.20 a.m. And then there's also Mahalia Jackson Sings, Devotional Moments, and Thoughts for the Day. So basically, if you're up in the wee hours of the morning, you could use some prayer, I guess is what they were thinking. And then they come back on at 7.15 with a sermonette, and then they start showing their programs around 8, 8 a.m. on Sunday. Now if we go to Sunday night, there are actually some good shows that I remember watching as a child when they were in reruns. We've got Lassie. I mean, I don't know who didn't love Lassie as a kid, right? Timmy and Lassie are training two homing pigeons that Timmy plans to enter in a race. But during a trial run, the two birds fail to come home. And hijinks ensue. I added that part. I'm sure you know that. Something called Ensign 
O'Toole. I don't know what that is. But then we have Dennis the Menace, which I absolutely remember. Oh, and wait, there's even better stuff. But first, let me read to you about Dennis the Menace. Wilson's Little White Lie. In order to avoid spending the afternoon with Dennis, Mr. Wilson says that he is very ill, and Dennis quickly spreads the word around to his parents and friends. Wilson played brilliantly by Gail Gordon, who was also in one of the Lucille Ball shows as Mr. Mooney. Remember Mooney is a meanie? Um, I, I don't know why that just popped out, but it did. But listen to what's on. I got so excited when I saw this, and perhaps you will too. The Jetsons. So at the time, the Jetsons were a prime time show, much like the Flintstones. And it's in color. So in this episode, Last Venus is where George and Jane Jetson decide to spend their second honeymoon. But shortly after they check into the supersonic Sands Hotel, a message from Boss Spacely spoils everything. George will have to mix a little business with his pleasure. I loved the Jetsons growing up. And also, Walt Disney's world is on with Johnny Shiloh a Civil War story. Okay, we'll keep going, though. And at 8 o'clock, it's time for a big, big show, which is what Ed Sullivan used to say, because it is Ed Sullivan. So Ed's guests include the McGuire sisters, Georgia Brown, co-star of the Broadway musical Oliver, Sergio Franchi, Italian tenor, Ben Blue, the Rigetti's acrobatic duo, the Williams Troop acrobatic jugglers. See, I told you, it was all like acrobats and plate spinners. And I loved that stuff as a kid. Then in the next hour, we've got Car 54, which I don't think I've ever seen an episode of, but it is on the cover of TV Guide this week. The Real McCoys, and Bonanza. And then at 9.30, something called GE True. Something also called, oh, that's a special. Here's Edie. So Edie Adams' third special of the season. She was a singer and dancer, as I recall. And then Candid Camera is on, which I don't remember loving, but I'm sure I watched. And then Monday morning, so again, early morning, 5.50 a.m., a sermonette, the farm report, a devotional moments show, and then Columbia lectures. And it's not until 7 a.m. that the news comes on. Some of the children's programming that is airing during the day includes Romper Room, And for the stay-at-home mother, we have Jack LaLanne, or I'm listening to a book, an audio book right now, and they're pronouncing it Jack LaLanne. I I always thought it was Jack LaLanne, but what do I know? Something called Music for Young People, The Sound of a Stradivarius. I can just tell you, even, I know I was only eight months old, but if I had been six years old, I wouldn't have cared. (laughs) As an adult, I'm interested. I Love Lucy is in reruns. Ernie Ford. What else is airing? Jane Wyman. Father Knows Best. These are all the reruns that are airing during the day. But I'm going to go a little later in the day because they're mentioning one of my all-time favorite shows as a child. Perhaps you remember it too. Mr. Ed. A talking horse. A horse is a horse, of course, of course. And then something, but whoever heard of a talking horse, unless, of course, unless the horse is the famous Mr. Ed. The Posts and the Addisons plan to spend a few days skiing at Pine Lake Lodge. 
but Roger isn't as talented at skiing as he is at some indoor activities like poker. But where's the horse? I need more horse action here. And at this point, changing gears from a talking horse, there is an ad here for the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite. So, I grew up with mad respect for Walter Cronkite. Okay, so let's see. What is on prime time? Something called Dakotas. It sounds like it is Western. Perhaps mutiny at Fort Mercy. Deputies Del Stark and Vance Porter return an army escapee to the stockade at Fort Mercy, commanded by the merciless Captain Ridgeway. I have no idea. But Chad Everett, who I always thought was very cute, is in it. But again, I was eight months old, so I was not watching it. But I just thought I would mention that. Lucille Ball. Now we're getting into territory that I know because I've watched all the different shows that Lucille Ball put out. Lucy becomes a reporter. Needing some quick cash to clear up a few bills, Lucy starts looking for part-time work when she learns that a society columnist friend of hers is going on vacation. Lucy manages to get herself hired as a substitute. And hilarity ensues. <laughs> I'm sure. Also is The Rifleman, which, again, I never really watched, but I know of, with Chuck Connors. And then The Danny Thomas Show, which I have some vague memories about. Hans Conried appears as Danny's uncle, Tanus, in this episode, in town for his annual physical examination to noose, it's spelled T-O-N-O-O-S-E, demonstrates to Charlie, Bunny, and the kids that he is still strong as a bull. Okay, I'm sure that was an entertaining episode. Something called Stony Burke. I have no idea what that is. But now we've got Andy Griffith, which I think I've shared with you before. Wes loves Andy Griffith. It's one of the shows we put on when he gets home because it helps him, you know, disengage from humanity and connect with a simpler time. So quite often there is Andy Griffith playing in our household. Andy gets a letter from Luke Comstock, a former convict he once wounded during a robbery attempt. Luke says that he's coming to see Andy and Barney figures that there's going to be a shootout. And then Loretta Young is on. Ben Casey. Now, I know that one. He was a doctor, right? I never watched the show, but I just remember that he was a doctor. Then it looks like there's something newsworthy from David Brinkley. There is also a two-page spread for a Bell and Howell movie theater kit. So there is, it must be an eight millimeter camera and a projector and lights. And it's about $150, which is the equivalent of about a grand right now. And at this point in 1963, Johnny Carson is already on the air and his guests include Burt Parks and Don Cherry. Okay, we'll go on over to Tuesday. So Lloyd Bridges has a show on. And then at 8.30, Red Skelton. I grew up loving Red Skelton. You know, when his show was on the air, we would always be watching it. So in this one, Red's guests are Phil Harris and his wife, Alice Fay. Also on is Hawaiian Eye, which I never saw, something called Empire. And then at 9.30, Jack Benny's show is on. Peter Laurie and songstress Joni Summers are Jack's guests. Opposite that is The Untouchables, 
which I think we've all heard of the untouchables. And then it looks like there's a special on, on Tuesday night with Mickey Rooney. It's called Everybody Loves Sweeney. It looks like it's a drama of some kind. Comedian Sweeney Tomlin has spent most of his life playing second-rate nightclubs, and he's resigned to the fact that he'll never hit the big time. Not so his wife, Aura, who is determined that her husband will someday be a headliner in the big money clubs. Frank Sinatra introduces the hour drama. So it stars Mickey Rooney, Joanne Linville, and I don't know the other people. Oh, Jack Albertson is in it. So I do know him. Not personally, of course, but I know who he is. <laughs> the Gary Moore variety show is on. I believe that that's where Carol Burnett got her start was on the Gary Moore show, as I recall. So in this episode, guests include Nancy Walker, Dorothy Collins, and the British comedy team of Blackburn and Reeves. Mikhail's Navy's on later. Chet Huntley has a special. I'm trying to see who's on Johnny Carson. I can't quite find it. Oh, Wally Cox is the guest. So there you go. And everything goes off the air by 2.20 with a sermonette. They'll pray you out into the new day. And then they pick you up at 5.50 in the morning with another sermonette. (laughs) I don't know why that cracks me up so much. I remember... You know, there would be all of this sermon and religious stuff that would be on the air in the late evening, in the early morning. And growing up Jewish, it was like, oh, yeah, (laughs) yay. Give me the good stuff, right? Give me something I actually want to watch. All right, we're now on Wednesday, and we'll get through Wednesday on this episode. Let's see what we got. So there seems to be a big special about Eisenhower. It says Eisenhower, 1963. Nine days ago, President Kennedy gave the annual State of the Union message. The day before yesterday, former President Eisenhower offered his own view of the State of the Union and the world since he left the nation's top post. The taped interview conducted by newsman Walter Cronkite at Ike's Palm Desert, California home covered such topics as the farm problem, the Cuban crisis, labor management, disputes, civil liberties, and more. Interesting. I wonder if my parents would have watched that. My parents were always very political, and my mom actually campaigned for Kennedy for his presidential campaign, and, interesting factoid, had a huge footlocker in our basement filled with Kennedy election memorabilia that was there forever. And our understanding was it it didn't have a lot of monetary value, but it's pretty cool. She was very active in his campaign. And then there's also a special called Hollywood with Henry Fonda and Mae West. So on October 6th, 1927, when Al Jolson sang to a movie house in The Jazz Singer, the era of sound movies began. This program traces the history of Hollywood from that night to the present, with Henry Fonda acting as a guide. Soon after the movies began to talk, musical extravaganzas burst onto the scene. And so it's talking about all of the things that are happening. And somewhere Mae West is involved because there's a big picture of her. And here we go. A first run episode of Beverly Hillbillies. I already said the words to the song once. I will not do that again to you. Back to California. The Clampets decide that it's time to head back to Beverly Hills. They want Cousin Pearl and Jethreen to come along for a visit. 
I'm sure I've seen that episode a dozen times, but don't remember it now. Then there's Andy Griffith. Barney tags the governor's car for illegal parking, and a short time later, he learns that the state's chief executive is coming to see him, and he fears the worst. And then there are the two specials, the Eisenhower one and the Hollywood one. So given that they were airing opposite of each other, I now know my parents for sure would have been watching the Hollywood one, the fabulous era, because my mom loved shows like that. And she wouldn't have cared about Eisenhower. Also airing is Dobie Gillis, which I don't think I've ever seen an episode of, but I've heard of. And it's a twofer, back-to-back episodes of Beverly Hillbillies. So in this next episode, Mr. Drysdale needs a housekeeper, and he tells Pearl that she might just be the woman he's looking for. But Pearl thinks that he means a more permanent arrangement like marriage. And I just got a warm spot in my heart because I see that they list Jane Hathaway, (laughs) played by Nancy Culp. She was a great character actress, or actor, in the day. And then we've got Perry Como in color. Perry's guests include Ray Bulger and Lauren Bacall, who makes her TV singing debut. And it features the Ray Charles singers. What's not to love about that show? Also airing is Dick Van Dyke. TV interviewer Ray Murdoch has a reputation for dissecting the guests on his show, and he has asked Rob to appear. Murdoch assures Rob that there will be no personal questions. But when they get on the air, Murdoch asks if Rob's wife is involved in the wacky incidents he translates into comedy sketches. Oh, Rob. (laughs) How many of you remember that? When Mary Tyler Moore's character would go, Oh, Rob. (laughs) All right, and at 10 o'clock, there's something called the U.S. Steel Hour, which looks like that was some sort of drama. Maybe each episode was a different drama. Something called Naked City and something called The Eleventh Hour. I have never heard of any of those. Oh my gosh. And you know what is airing at 11.15 on a Wednesday night? The Philadelphia Story. One of my favorite movies ever. If you have never seen The Philadelphia Story, do yourself a favor. It's so lovely and funny. It's with Cary Grant and Katherine Hepburn and Jimmy Stewart. And Cary Grant's character is named C.K. Dexter Haven. I love that movie. But of course, I was only eight months old, so I wouldn't be watching it. Not sure who's on Johnny Carson. They don't list it. It just is on. And then, of course, at 2.20, we've got our sermonette, a lovely sermon before you go to bed, and we'll wake you up in just a couple hours with another one for you. And then that brings us to Thursday. I should mention the children's programming that is airing at this time. It's Captain Kangaroo, which if you are of my generation, you will remember that, as well as Romper Room. And one of the things for me that was difficult about Romper Room was as a child, I believed that when she looked through that magic mirror to see us, that she would one day see me and say, and I see Laurel, which of course she would never do because my name was so different. She would see a Laurie, she would see a Laura, And I would get so sad and disappointed that she never saw me. So I don't think the magic mirror was such a good idea, unless you had a very common name. So just my little pet peeve from childhood about the magic mirror on Romper Room. All right, so that brings us to Thursday morning. So I'm not going to be able to go through the rest of the days, but I do want to say 
I did peek back at the TV guide crossword puzzle, and whoever owned this issue in 1963 did the entire thing in pencil, and every answer is there. So either they did it all the first time, or the next week they wrote in all the answers. I don't know which. But anyways, interesting, yes? I do have other issues from this era, so I'll try to finish this one up and maybe add another one on in a different episode. But that's a little flashback to 1963 and television back in the day. Hopefully this was just snoozy enough to help you drift off or interesting enough to keep you company if you mean to stay awake. So thank you so much, as always, for letting me spend this time with you. I am deeply grateful for you, and I love you very much. So you be well, and we'll talk again soon. Thank you.